Testing. Good morning. Were you guys waiting for me? Yeah? Have mercy. You know, guys, my tie is kind of off, but not my tie, my bow tie. But I guess I can't fix it. So that's fine. But how are you guys doing today? Let's try again, man. How are you guys doing today? Good? I, I hope so. I hope so. From, from here, everybody sounds a little bit tired. But that's okay. That's okay. It's okay. You know, it's okay to be tired. Because when we go through, uh, through our busy weeks, it does get tiring. Is, can you guys hear the feedback on that? Yeah. yeah? How about now? Better? Better? Okay. Well, church, I, I don't really want to waste much of your time. So what I want to do, ask you to do, is to take out your Bibles. I want you to go to the New Testament, to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. So we're in Philippians chapter 4. Take out your Bibles. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. And so what I would like for you to do is stay in this text. I want you to open your Bibles. And if you don't have your Bibles, get your phones out so that we can study our Bibles today. Philippians chapter 4. Verses 10 to 13. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regards to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, I am in to be content I know how to abase and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Our sermon title for today is, Is God Enough? Join me in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, Father, that as your word is proclaimed today, that it will not come back empty to you. And I ask, Father, that our hearts may be prepared, our minds may be ready to receive a message from your Holy Spirit. And so I ask that you may pour your Holy Spirit upon us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our sermon title is, Is God Enough? You know, I I think as believers, we, we tend to say that God is enough for us, but that statement is, is not always true in our everyday lives. And I'll tell you why, because most of us, we seek satisfaction, if not perfection, in our lives. We want to believe that God is enough for us, but yet what we do is we chase fulfillment somewhere else. So take a moment right now to ask yourself this question, is God enough for you? Take a moment, ask yourself, is God enough? enough for you. And the reason why I ask this question is, we live in a world that thrives on pleasure and happiness. And there's even this idea where we talk about self-love, where once I love myself enough, once I can love who I am, then I will be enough. And then on the other side, there's a lot of things that this world offers to fill our void in our hearts and to make us feel like we're enough. And I think that's why some of us, we get into drugs and alcohol. But maybe that's not close enough for us as we're sitting in church. Maybe we like to eat whatever we want. Maybe we like to do whatever we want. Maybe we like to watch whatever we want to watch. And we do all of these things because we want to make ourselves feel good. But here's the thing. Even though we run and search, there's still that emptiness. There's still that emptiness. And and time after time, we run to things that can give us monetary joy. Now, I remember a time when I went to go buy a car. I decided that finally I got myself a job. I saved some money. I'm going to go get myself a car. And so my wife and I, we walked into a Honda dealership. And I already had in my mind what I wanted to buy, what my budget was. And I went in and I said, I need a new car. 
And so the, the guy that was there, he said, no problem, I got you, I'm going to help you out. Whatever you need, you just tell me. So I said, all right, I want a Civic from, you know, 2015 to 2018, and I want a nice Honda Civic. And he says, all right, let me show you what I have. But now, mind you, as I walked into the place, what do you think I saw? Some brand new cars. I even saw the new model that came out that year, 2020 Honda Civic. And so I, I kind of glanced on it, I looked in it, and, and it had tinted windows, I mean, it looked good, and, and I saw it, and I was like, oh, have mercy. This, this looks good. So after the guy was done showing me all these cars, I wasn't satisfied. I said, I don't want this type of car. I want something better. So he said, you know, come to my office. Let's just compare the price difference between a new one and an, and an older one. So I said, you know what, let's do it. So we sat there, and he says, you know, here's the difference, and there's not, my, there's not much difference that you're going to pay if you buy a new one or a used one. So what do you think I did, church? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Guys, I walked out with a brand new car. <laughs> Doesn't that always happen when we go to a dealership? We have, we have in our mind what we want. I'm going to get this. I'm going to spend this. Never works out. Never works out. So here I was with my nice 2020 six-speed, you know, car. I loved it. I was driving it everywhere. But a month later, you know what happened a month later? A month later, Janelle and I went to get some groceries. And I parked next to this car. Now, i got to tell you about this car. Because this is the car that I really wanted. It was a Honda Civic. It was a Honda Civic, but it was an SI. That's a sports model for those that don't know what an SI is. And not only was it a sports model, it had some nice spoilers. And, and I looked at the rims and, and the tires. It was low profile and, and the car is kind of low and, and it's all tinted. And I'm looking at this car and I'm like, have mercy. <laughs> this car looks good. And then I turn right next to that car is my old boring car. I don't want it anymore. I was telling Janelle, I want this. This is the car. This is the car that I really want. Not my new 2020 Civic. And here's the, here's the message that, that, that I got that day when we were driving, is that I can never be satisfied. I wasn't satisfied with my used car, so I went to upgrade to another used car. Wasn't satisfied with that used car, so I went to get a new car. I wasn't satisfied with that new car because I wanted that model. As people, we always want more. I want more. I want better. I need more. I want more expensive things. And we're never truly happy. And as Christians, are, are we supposed to be happy with just God? And yet we, we always talk about this thing that God is enough, but, but is that really true? Is God enough plus all these other things that we want? And so I kept asking myself this question, and I had a reality check. Is God really enough for me? And so to answer our question, we're going to go to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, where Paul is going to teach us a powerful lesson as to how we can answer this question, is God enough? Now let me tell you something about the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is a very short book. If you just flip, you'll see that it only has four chapters. And the book was written by Paul. And what we do know is that at this time, as Paul is writing this book, he's in prison. So imagine, you're in prison, you're by yourself, and you're writing a letter to a church. So the church, what they decided to do for Paul was because they, they loved Paul, was they decided to send him gifts. So they had a guy, and the guy would go and he would give Paul gifts just so that he can be okay, just so that he is all right while he is in prison. And so we... We reach in verse 10, where Paul says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Paul says, I'm grateful that you care about me. Though you surely did not care, though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Paul says, Church, I understand that you're worried about me. And I'm glad to know that you care about me. And, and in fact, he rejoices in this fact that they want to help him more. But the church is in a position where they cannot do anything else for Paul. And so Paul is grateful for their support. And he says, even though you can't help me anymore, I'm grateful for what you have done. Now imagine the church. 
Imagine how the church must have felt where they want to help Paul, when they, where they want to give more to Paul, where they want to help him out. You know, he's one of their founding leaders, and, and they're probably thinking in their minds, is Paul going to make it through? Is he all right? Does he have enough? Will he be able to sustain himself while in prison? And as Paul is writing them, he's reassuring them, brothers and sisters, I'm quite all right. All these things that you give to me, they're just a bonus. They're nice. Hey, the gifts that you send me, they're great. But let me tell you something. They don't make my faith stronger. And so he begins to tell them, thank you, church, but I'm all right. And in verse 11, he, he further goes on to explain this. He says, not that I speak in regards to need. Now, if I'm in prison, I need everything. I would want the best of the best, the most of the, I would want everything I can. But Paul says, I do not speak in regards to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So Paul reassures them. He says, I'm not asking you from anything. I'm telling you that I'm doing all right. Now, don't miss this. Don't, don't miss this point. Paul is not fulfilled based on what he can get. Instead, he says, he has learned to be content. I want you to highlight that there if you have your Bibles. For I have learned. There, there's something that only God can teach us that in whatever state, whatever circumstance God is pleased to put me in, I am going to be content. Now, I know as a pastor, I get to talk to a lot of people. And most of the times I'll be, I'll be standing out the door and I'll be shaking people's hands. And throughout all my years, I mean, I can't, even, I can't even recall how many times there's always a brother or a sister in a church that always seems to be depressed. And when I'm standing at, outside shaking their hands, I'll ask them, hey, brother, hey, sister, how are you doing today? And they always say, pastor, I'm hanging on. And then the next week I'll see them again. I'll say, hey, brother, hey, sister, how are you doing? Pastor, I'm just hanging in there. And I think to myself, man, how, how good is your grip? Every single week, every single week, you're just hanging in there. You're always sad. You're always depressed. Like, like Christ is not enough for you. And I think to myself that as Christians, yes, we're going to go through things. Yes, we're going to have pain and suffering. But Christ is all that we need. And that in itself is joy for us. Paul reassures them that I have learned, and, and I want us to learn today, just like Paul, what that really means to be content. We need to learn that whatever state, whether in sickness or in health, whether rich, whether poor, whether life, whether death, that we can be content. I want to go to verse 12. Paul says, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So pause here for a second. So what he does now is Paul uses these extremes to highlight that he understands the range of human experience. Yes, and he understands the challenges that come with each position. Now what I want to tell you is that Paul is not a rich person telling a poor person to just move on with his life. Yeah. Or vice versa. What Paul is saying is, I've been there. I've been rich. And I've been poor, and I still understand that I can be content. I have been in all these situations. I have been there. I've done that. And let me tell you something. Nothing compares with the fact that God is with me. Amen. Now, Paul, out of anybody, Paul, out of anybody, had ample experience. And I want to share some of those experiences with you today. In 2 Corinthians, this is what Paul records for us. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in dangers from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in dangers from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger of cities, in danger of countries, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have learned and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I was hungry and I was thirsty. I've gone without food, I have been cold, and I have been naked. Paul says, I've been through it all. I've been through it all, and I have learned to be content. Now, brothers and sisters, the reason why you and I, we go through situations and circumstances 
is because God wants to do the same thing that he did in Paul. He wants to teach us how to be content. And so don't be discouraged when, when you're in a situation that doesn't make sense. Don't be discouraged when, when life doesn't make sense to you because what God is trying to do is he's trying to teach us how to be content. Now what Paul does is Paul's going to give us an answer in the next verse. He's going to give us the secret of his contentment, which is in verse 13. It's a text we all know. It says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, did you catch the secret? See, we all know Philippians chapter 4, verses 13. And what we do with this text is we tell others that with Jesus, I can do anything. There's nothing that can stop me. And I think this Bible text, we use this Bible text in our modern context when it comes to working out or when it comes to being an athlete. And if you know Tim Tebow, right, you know that he'll put Philippians 4 when he's about to go play football so that he can win. And I've done the same thing where I've recited this text for when I want to get something out of life. And especially when I used to work out, I used to lift my weights and I used to say, in Jesus, hey, I can squat squat this 300 pounds. But is that, is that what Paul's talking about? So from this, Paul's not saying that whatever goal I have for my life, I can accomplish it. He's saying whatever state I'm in, I'll be satisfied because God is my strength. See, Christ gives us strength to go on, and we don't need anything else. Christ is the source of our existence. He gives us strength when, he, when we need it. To do all things is not achieve all things, but endure all things with contentment. That's what he's trying to communicate. That's what he's trying to say. And, and that's why when we are in this situation, just like David wrote in Psalm 33, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We don't need anything else outside of having God, outside, outside of having Christ in our lives. We can choose to put our hope in the things of this world. We can fill our hearts with the desire of this world. Or instead, we can choose to rely on Christ and his strength. Our money, our health, everything around us will fade away. Our cars will break down. But Christ's strength will always be there. That word contentment in the Greek means independent of others, right? And self-sufficient in oneself. And it's not that we put our sufficiency in ourself in this context, sufficiency in Christ. We are content with Christ. And if anything is taken away, it doesn't matter because those things don't define who we are. Do you guys know that song, I'd Rather Have Jesus? This would be a perfect time for me to sing, right? You ever see those pastors where they come up? And they, they just break out in a song. I mean, I'm not Rolando, so I can't do that. So I'll just read the lyrics for you. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his near-pierced hands. Jesus is all that we need. So whether we face good, whether we face bad, we can be assured that Christ is with us. Now I want you to help me out for a second. I'm going to say a sentence and I want you to help me out. At the end of the sentence, I want you to say, God is enough, okay? When a friend betrays me, when I need to forgive what seems unforgivable, when I struggle professionally, when others don't recognize my value, when someone I love hurts me, when my past haunts me, when my health declines, he truly is enough. I hope that you can believe it. And I hope this morning that whatever you get out of this sermon, I hope that you can remember this, that Christ is enough. You know what's funny? When, when you reach, when, when you come to that point where you can just be content, you're going to confuse people. Because they're going to wonder, Brother Orlando, how are you so happy? And you're going through so much. When you go through stuff, people will look at you and wonder, what's going on? And that's when you can say, Christ is my strength. I want to read this quote to you. I love this quote. John Piper said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Amen. God is most glorified in us 
when we are most satisfied. And how true is that? That God will be glorified when we're content in him. I remember like when I was in high school, all I ever wanted to do was be a pastor. I was like, man, I'm going to be a pastor. And so I was so happy to be done high school. I graduated high school and I finally made my way to university. And we always have this idea in our minds that, hey, once I achieve something, I need something more. Right? Once I finish high school, I need to finish college. I need to get a job. I need to get married. So we kind of have this idea that I always have to reach somewhere to feel good. And so for me, it was, I got to be a pastor. And when I was in university, I dreamed. I was like, man, I can't wait. I can't wait. Four years? That's too long for me. I want to be a pastor right now. (laughs) Four years passed by, and I finally became a pastor, and I was pastoring. And when I was pastoring, I said to myself, is this it? Is this all that I've been waiting for all these years? And then I said to myself, no, no, I got to get my master's. I got to be ordained. And I realized that I was falling into this trap of wanting to achieve things so that I can feel good about myself. And God had to teach me, your job doesn't matter. Whether you have it or don't have it, that doesn't matter. Your position, whether you're a pastor or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is, am I in your life and am I in your heart? Christ really is enough. Because here's the thing, brothers and sisters, I mean, who knows? I might not even be a pastor for the rest of my life. But that's not the point. The point is, am I choosing to put Christ in my heart? And so I ask you this question. The question now remains for you. I had that reality check, but now you have to have that reality check for yourself. And you can only answer that for yourself. Is Christ enough? Psalm 43 verses 1 says, As the deer pants for waters, so I long for you, O God. My prayer today is that we will long for God as the deer pants for water. Every eye is closed and every head is bowed. Father, we are grateful that you are enough. And and what's funny, God, is we talk about it, we preach about it, we say it, but is that something that we are living? And so I ask, Father, that today that we will make that choice, we will make that decision to recognize that you are the only thing that, that is important. You are the only thing that will ever be able to get us through when we need it. Our friends will fail us, our family will, but you will always be by our side. And so, Lord, I pray a special prayer for every single person, including me, that today, again, we will say yes to you. Lord, we choose to follow you, to to obey you, to surrender our life. And, Father, we want to be content. And as we're content in you, you will be glorified. Thank you, Father, that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you answer our prayers. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.